ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Does science rule out faith as an impossibility? And just how complicated is that question anyway? Greetings, I'm Tom Gilson. Today's ID the Future episode comes courtesy of the Know Why podcast, hosted by Liberty McCarter. She's interviewing the Discovery Institute's Jonathan Witt, and in various ways, that's the question they pursue here. The Christian worldview actually gave birth to science. Uh, this is you know, kind of a best-kept secret. Uh, if you talk to some atheist, you would get the idea that Christianity uh, somehow stymied science. Welcome to the Know Why Podcast. I'm your host, Liberty McCarter. For many of us, it's not enough to know what people say about life's most important questions. We also want to know why. Each week, Know Why tackles tough questions on topics ranging from spirituality to current events. While we approach these issues from a Christian perspective, we discuss diverse opinions and ultimately dive into what the research says. Are you ready to know why? Let's get started. Are faith and science at war? Welcome to the Know Why Podcast. I'm your host, Liberty McCarter. Research shows that Gen Z, the generation born after 1995, identifies as atheist at double the rate of the general population. 46% of teens and millennials say, I need factual evidence to support my beliefs, according to Barner Research Group. And only 28% of teens and 25% of young adults believe science and the Bible are complementary. In short, many people today are under the impression that if you are an intellectual and believe in science, so to speak, you just can't believe in God, at least not as the Bible presents him. Here to challenge that notion today is my guest, Jonathan Witt. He is the executive editor of Discovery Institute Press and a senior fellow and a senior project manager with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. His latest book is Heretic, one Scientist's Journey from Darwin to Design uh, that he co-wrote with Madi Lesela. He was a lead writer and associate producer of the award-winning documentary Poverty Incorporated and has also written other documentaries um, and his academic articles and editorials have been widely published in a variety of periodicals and newspapers respectively. He previously served as a tenured professor of literature and writing at Lubbock Christian University and has a PhD with honors in English and literary theory from the University of Kansas. And that is actually just a small portion of his impressive biography. So thank you so much for joining us today, Jonathan. You bet, Liberty. Good to be on. Well, obviously, as we've seen from your bio, you have experience and expertise in an array of fields. But can you tell us just a little bit more about your background in science and what draws you to the study of science? Yeah, I'd probably be best to think of me as a, a journalist in terms mm-hmm. of my science background, uh, because I'm trained in literature and uh, reasoning, uh, taught English for many years, composition, taught uh, spotting logical fallacies, how to reason well. Uh, and then I got into the think tank world and had the privilege of working alongside and working with uh, scientists from a variety of backgrounds. I worked with astrobiologists, I worked with um, biochemists, geologists, Uh, philosophers of science. So it's been a real privilege working at the Discovery Institute alongside uh, these scientists, you know, people like uh, Michael Behe at Lehigh University, uh, uh, other other guys trained at Cambridge. Uh, And so uh, it's, so whereas I'm not a scientist myself, uh, I've worked alongside scientists. I've studied the debate uh, as a, you know, kind of as a a third party, an objective third party and become uh, just persuaded by just how powerful the ev- scientific evidence there is for God and for design. Uh, it's It's been a, been a fascinating ride. Well, on that note, um, you are obviously a Christian believer. And so what is your response um, when somebody questions whether you can believe in science and also believe in God? Yeah, I mean, there's the, the most basic response I would give is that the Christian worldview actually gave birth to science. Uh, this is, you know, kind of a best kept secret. Uh, if you talk to some atheist, you would get the idea that Christianity uh, somehow stymied science. When in fact, of all the different cultures, all the different civilizations in the world down through history, we have to ask ourselves: Why is it that Christian Europe uh, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance—that's the place that gave birth to science? It wasn't 
the ancient Greeks, though they had some brilliant philosophers and thinkers, it wasn't India, it wasn't China, um, it, it wasn't the Egyptian uh, thinkers, it was medieval and Renaissance Europe. Uh, now, a racist would say, oh, that's because Europeans are somehow superior. Uh, but that's been disproven by science. That's ridiculous. We're not uh, racist. We know, we know the evidence is against that. So what, what was it that the Europeans had? That Well, they had the Judeo-Christian worldview, and that uh, fired the imaginations, and it ordered the reasoning of those that gave birth to the scientific revolution. We can go through and talk about some of the ways uh, that that Christian worldview helped uh, birth the scientific revolution, or we can we can jump ahead today and say, you know what, there are there are scientists in our age uh, who see uh, nature, see the, the even recent discoveries pointing to intelligent design, pointing to evidence of a God. We have Nobel laureates like Arno Penzias, Charles Towns. These are brilliant uh, physicists, astronomers, who said very pointedly when they look at the the evidence of fine tuning and the laws and constants of physics and chemistry. They're fine-tuned to allow uh, for beings like ourselves, for, for life, and even advanced life, they say the fine-tuning, the, the fact that the universe uh, appeared out of nothing in the Big Bang, all these things come together and are best explained by reference to a cosmic designer. So I think uh, when you look past a lot of the smoke and mirrors and a lot of the bluffing from the atheist, uh, science, science should, should be... Uh, seen as and is is a friend to theistic faith. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because something else I was going to mention is that, um, you know, obviously public perception is that scientists or science as a field um, are hostile to religion. But uh, there is some research showing, and I read this a couple years ago, I think it was re- reported on in Christianity Today, that the majority of people who work in science-related fields are religious. And you actually were mentioning you know, um, very prestigious actual scientists, but even in the scientist related fields, science related fields um, are, are populated by religious people. And then again, throughout history, as you were mentioning, uh, some of the most prominent scientists and, and people who developed as so much of what we know today um, or discovered, they were, they also had strong religious faith. And that's um, a, maybe something you touch on in your latest book um, that we mentioned in your bio uh, you you co-wrote a book on intelligent design and the story specifically of how one scientist set out to defend evolution, and he ended up questioning it. But I'm guessing that his story probably isn't unique today. That's right. Yeah, the person, uh, you, I think you mentioned his name earlier, Mati Laisala. Uh, he was a highly, highly successful bioengineer, uh, Finnish bioengineer. He also so lived, lived and worked in Sweden. Um, he uh, grew up, went through college, graduate school, being taught uh, the standard Darwinian paradigm. Uh, but then when he finally started studying it in his area where he had most expertise, enzymes, uh, enzymes are a type of protein that are absolutely essential for life processes, he, the Darwinian story started to break down. Uh, he, he, he realized there was no credible way that uh, enzymes, uh, these very sophisticated uh, molecular protein machines, could have evolved through any blind process. Uh, and he, you know, of course, continued to research that. And so that book is, is a, uh, it tells a story of him moving into an intelligent design position. Now, I, I do want to add a caveat here. There are Christians, um, faithful, thoughtful Christians, who, uh, who look for ways to integrate or, how shall I say, harmonize uh, their theistic Christian worldview with some form of Darwinian evolution. Uh, they might be going to the theistic uh, evolutionist, uh, theistic Darwinist. Um, I'm not saying those people are, are bad. I, I disagree with them personally about trying to kind of salvage uh, Darwinian evolution, but they are out there. Uh, guys like Francis Collins, who, who see powerful evidence of design in, as uh, I mentioned, the example of the fine tuning of the laws and constants of physics and chemistry. He's also pointed to uh, the, the kind of moral nature of humans. He, at one time, at least, he, he didn't see how evolution could properly explain how we are moral beings, um, the, the origin of life. Uh, that was, I think, another thing he pointed to as something that may have required intelligent design. So so the, the evidence for design in nature is so abundant that even those scientists that try to somehow accommodate Darwinism to their Christian worldview, they still see abundant evidence of design in other areas. 
Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. But even so, I think that goes to show, you know, with the example of people like Francis Collins, that again, science and faith are not incompatible. And there may even be some disagreement within the faith community about exactly, you know, what things mean or, or you know, kind of the things you mentioned. But um, there's still, you know, room for robust belief in, in intelligent design and in a higher power um, and even the God of the Bible um, while still being able to uh, pursue science. Um, and so they're probably... Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you know, we think of... Uh the Bible, and we come to the Bible, and those of us that have a high view of Scripture, you know, see it and understand it as the Word of God. It's inspired by God and infallible. Uh, we have to be careful, though, that we don't forget that whereas God is infallible and His Word is infallible, our understanding of Scripture is not necessarily infallible. So we can uh, we can think of God as, and we see this in, in Psalm 19, this idea of God's two books, his, his book of special revelation, the Bible, uh, but also his book of general revelation. You know, Psalm 19 talks about the, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, it pours forth speech. And it pours forth evidence of the Creator. So that's his book of general revelation. So that, that's a, a concept uh, that uh, Christians uh, took uh, into the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance, and, and Christian thinkers and students of nature uh, took that idea, this idea that nature is a book, and it's the it is book written by the author of nature. It's rational because our, our creator is rational. They went looking for a hidden underlying rational order of nature because they believed in a rational creator, and they found it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of, in a nutshell, the birth of, birth of science. But it's one thing to believe all that. It's another thing is you come to the Bible to think, my first reading of a passage is infallible. That would be a mistake. So, for instance, uh, there are, are passages in the Bible that talk about the sun rising and the sun setting. Somebody could take that and say, look, that's proof that the sun revolves around the earth. Um, you know, b- back for centuries, and everybody, every culture, everywhere believed that mm-hmm. uh, the sun revolved around the earth, regardless of, of religious view. Uh, but then as, you know, as Christian scientists like uh, Copernicus uh, and Galileo studied, and, and they developed telescopes and started to realize that, hey, maybe maybe actually the Earth revolves around the sun, and it only looks as if uh, the sun revolves around the Earth because the Earth is rotating. Uh, there were some that protested, well, you know, wait a minute. You know, the Bible says that the, the sun rises and the sun sets. But uh, wiser minds prevailed and said, well, you know, these, these passages in the Bible are describing what, what things look like from, you know, the surface of the earth as, you know, we, we wake up, we see the sunrise. Even today, you and I, we go outside, the most brilliant astronomers will talk about, oh, that was a beautiful sunrise. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not arguing that uh, the earth uh, is the center of the solar system, the sun goes around it. So that, that's just one example of how you can kind of, if you're not careful, you can assume certain things that the, the Bible's teaching when, when it's not. It, it's using a a phenomenal way of describing something that's going on. Now, as far as Genesis 1 and 2, there's a lot of debates about, uh, does that describe a, a young earth of just a few thousand years? Uh, are the days uh, of Genesis uh, long periods of time? Are there gaps in the genealogies? There's a lot of thoughtful people on different sides of that, but I think if we come at it with humility and we, we kind of look step back and take the take in the larger picture, uh, which gives us abundant evidence that nature is the work of design. We can work out uh, some of those kind of lower level issues, uh, even as we are, you know, kind of blown should be blown away by the, by the powerful evidence that that nature is the work of a of a amazing powerful designer. Mm. Um, and I'm really glad you brought up you know that perspective on reading the Bible because I know there are a lot of people who say, you know, well there's no scientific evidence for or even historical evidence for things mentioned, particularly in the Old Testament. Um, and so you talked about, obviously, our our first reading, you know, is not always perfect. We don't always understand. Um, but can you expound on that a little bit more, maybe for somebody who it's a stumbling block that they just think, well, I can't, you know, be intellectually honest and believe what the Bible's saying here because it, it clear so clearly doesn't make scientific sense or something, or maybe they're not approaching Scripture in the correct way? Right, yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of threads, and if, you, if um, 
Well, one is some people say, well, there's, the Bible can't be true because there's these miracles. Well, how can there, why do you say there can't be miracles? Sometimes they'll say that and not even realize that they're, they're actually just propagating a question begging assumption uh, called uh, that goes that technically goes by the name of, of materialism or philosophical materialism or naturalism, which says uh, basically that the only things in the universe are you know matter and energy and the laws of nature, and you can't have anything that breaks that. Well, that, that's a philosophical outlook and assumption. It's not a, a scientific um, conclusion uh, mm-hmm. based on evidence. Now. We can all agree that that nature is orderly. That 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 assumption uh, was part of the scientific revolution. It was based on um, the belief of or of Christians, um, Galileo, Copernicus, you know, Newton, all, all these great scientists. Boyle, on and on we could go. That God was an orderly creator. It was a rational creator, and He created a, an orderly universe. But to go beyond that, and say there can never be any miracle by the creator of the entire universe of being powerful enough to bring the whole universe into being, uh, that, that's an assumption without, without evidence. So, so that's my, my first thing I would say, but be careful that somebody's not foisting on you this question begging assumption that miracles are somehow illogical. Uh, mm-hmm. now it would be illogical and jumping the gun. If every time somebody said, Oh, there was a miracle yesterday, uh, you know, such and such happened, and trust me, it was a miracle. Well, you know, you need to look into the evidence. Uh, there's powerful evidence, I would argue, for for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, and that that would be a whole topic for another day. Mm-hmm. Uh, strong historical evidence that um, the grave was empty, and that uh, this movement just exploded uh, from the empty tomb. Uh, but to move back to kind of more traditional scientific uh, type matters, it was conventional wisdom among a lot of uh, physicists and, physicist and astronomers in the late 19th century that the universe was eternal. Uh, the Bible teaches that the universe came into being, uh, you know, when God called it into existence. Well, in the 20th century, evidence started to mount and mount and mount, and now it's conventional wisdom that the universe did come into being in the Big Bang. Uh, mm. The uh, Einstein uh, uncovered some evidence in his theory of general rel- relativity. He didn't like where that evidence went, he came up with a fudge factor to try to avoid the implications of a cosmic beginning. Uh, but the, the evidence just kept growing. Uh, Hubble, you know, the, you've heard of the Hubble telescope, mm-hmm. named after Edwin Hubble. He discovered that the galaxies, that we're not just in one galaxy, but there are millions of galaxies, and that the further those galaxies are away from us, the faster they're moving away from us. Mm. Uh, and then there was also a, there was also a Catholic astronomer uh, George Lamatra, uh, who actually developed the Big Bang Theory. And basically it boils down to the idea that the universe came into being from a tiny point and expanded out from that point, and it's still expanding. Atheists hated the idea because they wanted to cling to their eternal universe model, because if you have an eternal universe in their mind, well, then you don't have to, to explain the origin of the universe. Uh, it, it's always been. But mm-hmm. it turns out the universe did come into being came into being uh, ex nihilo, that, that's a, uh, an ancient term, uh, out of nothing. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches, that the universe came into being out of nothing. God called it into being out of nothing. So uh, there's an example of where conventional wisdom was overturned, and it you know, pointed and strengthened the case for Christian theism. Wow, that's also interesting, and I think it's a good reminder uh, for anyone listening, regardless of where they stand on religious belief that, you know, there is still so much happening in the world of discovery. There's so much that we don't know and we're constantly learning. So just because there might be something, you know, in the Bible, for instance, if you're reading that, that doesn't make sense uh, right away or that you can't, you feel like you can't prove scientifically, it doesn't mean that we may not discover the answer at some point, or maybe we never will um, discover every answer to every question. Um, But that doesn't necessarily have to be a hindrance because there's so much knowledge in the world do we really expect that we're going to understand everything about it um and so on that point i wanted to come back to intelligent design um and i just think that for some people who may be listening you know they may be unaware because they were always taught that um you know evolution uh, uh 
per Darwin, so to speak, was is fact and just how the world came into being. And anybody who thinks anything else is, you know, fringe or something like that. But there's actually a robust body of academic work and science being done by people who believe in intelligent design. Um, and so I don't know a whole lot about the details of that other than that it exists. So in layman's terms, can you kind of, I I think you've already mentioned a lot of it, but give us a glimpse of just kind of the work that is going on um, by people who are studying the intelligent design theory. Yeah, that's a great question. And if if you want to go and learn more about this before I dive into that, that answer, go to discovery.org and, and go to the intelligent design section of that website. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll find a lot of resources. There are hundreds, I would say thousands, of, of scientists that are skeptical of modern Darwinian theory. And I'm not talking about the original version of it that Charles Darwin. There's been a lot of changes, a lot of additions, a lot of add-ons, neo-Darwinism, uh, the extended evolutionary synthesis. But even that, even those 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 more you know developed, uh, complicated versions of it that take into account you know developments in DNA genetics. Uh, there are there are well trained, highly trained uh, biologists, paleontologists that just reject it because they just do not see it as capable of building the information rich structures, uh, the molecular machinery, the amazing molecular machinery that that uh, scientists have been uncovering mm-hmm. in the last few decades. Uh, so, and so I think that's a that's a growing field. And then you have. Uh, what's, what I find interesting is you, ha- you have those that are committed to materialism who are rejecting contemporary Darwinism. Uh, and you, you have at the Royal Society of London, uh, three or four years ago, they had, they had a meeting and they came together to, you know, they basically said, you know, Darwinism is in huge trouble. Uh, it can't explain uh, some things that are, that are, you know, getting harder and harder to explain. Uh, we need to find uh, an extended evolutionary synthesis. We need to develop an extended synthesis that will ex- somehow, uh, you know, address these these growing problems. And so you had these different scientists come together, and someone said, "Oh, well, we can we should use this explanation over here, or why don't, why don't we use this patch over here?" And so there were lots of uh, lots of attempts to to patch the problem, but none of them agreed because you know one guy over here with his favorite you know pet. Uh, explanation or you know solution would get critiqued by this other guy over here and say, well, that doesn't solve this, and this doesn't solve this. So there's actually behind the scenes, if you go to like a, a textbook, uh, like a high school biology textbook, all is, all is right with the world of, of evolutionary theory and everything's been explained except for a few little details they're trying to, to patch up. But if you actually get behind the scenes and, and actually look at the, some of the academic journals and look at some of the, these high-level conferences, uh, there's a great deal of, of concern. Uh, there are growing problems, and uh, you, you're just not going to get that if you you j- jump in and look at a high school biology textbook because it's going to those are those are usually 10, 20, 30 years behind what's going on uh, mm-hmm. at the cutting edge. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. and by the way, a lot of textbooks. Uh, if I had to recommend one book to kind of puncture your one's uh, kind of naive faith in biology textbooks, it mm-hmm. would be uh, a well, two books, one called The Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells, and then his follow-up book called Zombie Science. And he goes through and talks about how biology textbooks will use what he calls icons of evolution, these, these punchy uh, evidences for evolution, but these the punchy evidences that have been disproven, like mm-hmm. Hackle's embryo drawings. You'll find these cropping up in biology textbooks. Hackle's embryo drawings say, look how... Humans at early stages of their embryonic development look like a fish or, you know, mm-hmm. this other animal. See, that's, that's a biology replicating the evolutionary process in the stages of the embryo uh, as it develops. Well, he fudged those drawings. Mm-hmm. He, even leading uh, evolutionists have admitted that those are completely fudged, uh, should not be used, you know, like a Harvard paleontologist, Stephen Jay Gould. He said, this is, this is a, you know... This is uh, sh- this is shameful. We need mm-hmm. to stop using that. And yet, the biology textbooks will keep using these and other discredited icons. Why would they do that? Why wouldn't they go use super incredibly powerful um, evidence that hasn't been discredited? Uh, Jonathan Wells' argument: Well, ultimately, they don't have that much powerful evidence, so they have to t- make recourse to these discredited icons and just hope that people don't uh, do more research into the matter. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well. 
I would guess uh, just from the young people that I know that if you said, hey, guess what? Your uh, school textbook may not be up to date or may have some misinformation in it. They probably wouldn't find that too hard to believe. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, yeah. And they don't have to take it on faith. Go, like I said, go find, uh, just pull up uh, Icons of Evolution. You can find the book. And there's also a website that will give, give a lot, a lot of the evidence just right there. Um, now, you may say, well, then how come smart scientists can still believe in it? I mean, because surely some of these guys, you know, know that these things are false, yet they still believe in it. Well, I think it goes back to this commitment. Uh, even some theistic uh, Christian scientists will say, well, God created the universe, but at the beginning, but then after that, we really have to to stick with, you know, unbroken laws of nature because we, we don't want to be invoking God at every turn just because we don't understand something. Mm-hmm. So they actually, they they hold to this idea called methodological materialism, you know. Okay, n- no, matter isn't all there is. There's a God. Uh, there's a supernatural realm, but when I'm a scientist, I'm only going to entertain uh, explanations uh, that invoke purely material causes, and so the, so they 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 can they have a straitjacket on their mind, if you will, mm-hmm. and and so they live in these kind of two two worlds. Well, there's a God, there's a creator, he's powerful, but when I'm doing science, I can only consider materialistic explanations and evolutionary theory, you know, some version of Darwinism. Is really the only game in town for explaining the origin of, of biological structures. So I have to somehow make it work, uh, and and so so they uh, and so then for instance they'll point to things like well you look at the different the genes the genetic code uh, of different animals and plants and there's a lot of similarities there. See that that points to common descent. Well maybe, uh, but then if you turn you come back at them and say couldn't it also be explained by common design? Uh, just mm-hmm. like, you know, uh, an airplane, a car, bike, they all use wheels, but that doesn't mean they're, you know, descended, you know, willy-nilly from some evolutionary process. It, it, it's a product of common design. The, uh, the wheel was a useful feature uh, in each of those different types of machines, and so designers reuse them. God could be reusing useful, you know, forms of, of DNA, genetic information to accomplish similar things in various types of plants and animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, can we investigate and see which way the evidence goes one way or the other? The Some evolutionists, not all of them, but many of them will say, well, you know, we, we can't consider common design because that violates methodological materialism. We just need to go with, with common descent. Well, fine if you, you want to think that way, but uh, most of us would like to follow the evidence and consider both options uh, and, and not be straightjacketed uh, by a methodological rule that basically amounts to question begging. Right. Wow. Well, uh, there's so much interesting information here, and and we are going to have a blog post up with this podcast episode um, with the books that Jonathan is mentioning, um, as well as other resources you may be interested in looking into. Um, And before we log off, Jonathan, I just wanted to give you um, an opportunity to speak to somebody who's listening. Maybe they're a young person who's interested in studying science, or maybe they are studying science and they're interested in um, they're interested in God and, and thinking about religion. Um, and I think sometimes you kind of touched on it a minute ago. People may feel that if they're doing science um, as a, a believer, that they might have to compromise their spiritual beliefs to acknowledge the science or vice versa. And so um, I know you said you, you come at this more from a journalistic perspective, but what advice would you have for somebody about, you know, maybe they don't have to compromise their spiritual beliefs or, or what they're seeing um, whenever they're studying the scientific data, yeah, absolutely. They they, sh- they don't have to. They shouldn't. They uh, now de- depending on the particular scientific field they go into, it's going to be easier or more challenging. Uh, and I don't mean ch- the evidence. I think in every major scientific field, the evidence ultimately points to God if you if you dig deep enough. Uh, but there's going to be more uh, peer pressure is going to be greater in certain fields. You know, if you if you go into evolutionary biology, you're going to get a lot of pressure just to conform to a materialistic evolutionary uh, paradigm. Uh, if you go into uh, physics, it's gonna you're gonna have less pressure. You know, you're gonna have some people that say, "Oh, we we've got to come out, explain away somehow explain away fine tuning," um, but you're gonna have others like uh, you know the, the Nobel laureates I mentioned that are saying, "No, it really points to God." So it depends on the field you go into. If you, you go into biology, uh, I would not recommend picking fights with your you know if you have a atheistic you know pro Darwin 
biology professor picking fights with them in class. That's, you know, that's not, not prudent. Uh, mm-hmm. Learn what you can, learn, learn the arguments for the theory, but also go out and learn the, the best evidence, the, the weaknesses in the theory. And then you'll actually be much better situated to reason through the evidence than somebody that either hears all the pro evidence or just all the con evidence. You want to want to filter hear both sides. And I think if you do that, you'll see uh, that there's powerful evidence. And eventually, when you get in a better position in terms of your career, you can pr- prudently start to um, kind of open up other people's minds to to the contrary evidence. The evidence that is pointing to intelligent design is suggesting that mindless processes alone cannot build, you know, wondrous things like the eye or, or the bacterial flagellum motor, um, you know, all, all the amazing organisms we find around us. Well, great advice. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jonathan. Um, again, we'll have those resources posted for anybody who wants to dive deeper. And that's all we have for today. But thanks so much for listening to the Know Why podcast. That was Liberty McCarter, host of the Know Why podcast, talking faith and science with Discovery Institute senior fellow Jonathan Witt. We have much to share with you here, so we look forward to your being back with us. Please bring a friend or a colleague or a social media connection along with you. You'll find us, as always, at idthefuture.com. We appreciate it, and we appreciate your being here with us today. For ID the Future, I'm Tom Gilson. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.